Hey everyone, Nico Carver here. I often start my videos by saying I'm a deep sky astrophotographer, but I realize there are a lot of terms we use in the hobby of amateur astronomy that really could use a bit of explanation, and a deep sky object, or DSO for short, is one of those terms. So here's my definition based on how people actually use the term in my experience. A deep sky object is any object out in space, outside of our solar system excluding individual stars and the Milky Way as a whole. So let's break this down a bit more, um, and I'll start with the things that are not deep sky objects. The first group are solar system objects, and these include the moon, the planets, asteroids, meteors, and comets. I'll talk about more about comets next week because we're going to be talking about Charles Messier and his famous uh, catalog of not comets. Uh, the moon and the planets are, of course, very bright in our night sky, the brightest objects in our night sky, because they're lit by our sun. Um, and speaking of the sun, the next category of things we don't call deep sky objects are individual stars. So even though, by definition, all stars other than our sun are outside of our solar system, if it's an individual star, we don't call that a deep sky object. Uh, the last thing we typically don't call a deep sky object is our own galaxy, the Milky Way, as a whole. Now, of course, there are many deep sky objects within the Milky Way. So let's cover now what is included under the term deep sky object. We have star clusters, which can be further broken down into open star clusters, like the Beehive Cluster, or uh, M44, and globular star clusters, like M13. We have my favorite, personally, nebulae, which can be broken down into many categories, but the main three are uh, emission nebulae, like the Lagoon, reflection nebulae, like the Pleiades, and dark nebulae, like the Boogeyman Nebula. Most star clusters and nebulae that we photograph are inside our Milky Way galaxies. Again, most star clusters and nebulae are inside the Milky Way. Which leads me to the last big type of deep sky object, which is galaxies. And to break that down further, galaxies come in many different types, uh, like spiral galaxies, barred galaxies, starburst galaxies, irregular galaxies, and interacting galaxies. Okay, so that's it. Now that you know what a DSO is, why is this a useful distinction? Well, for the amateur astronomer or astrophotographer, the, thing, the practical thing you need to know about DSOs is that they are usually dimmer than solar system objects and individual stars. Um, there's, we call them faint fuzzies for a reason, and this makes them a lot more challenging to observe at the eyepiece visually. They're slightly less challenging photographically because the camera has this unique advantage of being able to take long exposures, which our eyes can't do. Our eyes are like high frame rate video cameras, refreshing all the time. But of course, the long exposures in a camera add new wrinkles due to the Earth's rotation. So in the end, DSOs are challenging to both view and to photograph, but they're so beautiful, I think that challenge is well worth taking on. One last thing, and I'm saving it for last because I realize it's a bit pedantic, the more agreed upon term is deep sky, but you'll see many people using deep space and deep sky interchangeably. But just so you know, when people say deep space object, I think they're referring to the exact same thing as a deep sky object. The only reason I bring this up, and I think that it gets a little functionally confusing, is NASA named their array of giant radio antennas that receive messages from our interplanetary spacecraft, like the Mars rover, the Deep Space Network, that's the name for the antennas. But they're referring to a communication system for spacecraft within our solar system. So to avoid potential confusion, I'll always use the term deep sky object rather than deep space object. Well, that wraps it up. This was the first in a new series I'm calling Five Minute Fridays. Hopefully I stayed to that limit. Um, and I'm gonna try my best every week to keep it under five minutes. Next week, I'll be talking about Charles Messier and the Messier catalog and why it's still important to know about for amateur astrophotographers. Till then, this has been Nico Carver from nebulaphotos.com. Clear skies.